Amen. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6 verse 11 and verse 12 and 13. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed them to the disciples and disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. And when they were filled he said to his disciples gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And when they gathered up them, they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over from those who were eaten. This is a story that's recorded in all four Gospels about Jesus doing a very incredible miracle of multiplying bread and fish. And this is a very incredible and interesting miracle, but it holds an application that applies to us today as Christians and those of us who are also exploring their faith or trying to find uh, what they believe or trying to find their faith. It's very interesting because everything starts with the Bible says a multitude coming to Jesus, a lot of people coming to Jesus and they spend a very long time with Jesus and when they were already spend a lot of time with Jesus, disciples come to Jesus and give him an advice and a strategy. They said, Jesus, send those people away. Send the masses, multitudes, a lot of people, send them away. And Jesus says, why? He says, well, because it's too late. Uh, reason number two is they'll have enough time to go to the local restaurants. Reason number three, all the uh, Pizza Hut of Jerusalem is being closed by six o'clock and they have only 30 minutes to get to those Pizza Hut places. McDonald's is being closed, Taco Bell is being closed and Arby's. And you gotta send them so that they can have enough time to get to those places to get some food. And by the way, we are running low on the funds. So we can't buy them anything, you gotta send them off. And it's interesting that the crowds were around Jesus, masses were around Jesus, but disciples were not, they were not big enough in their heart for masses. Jesus loves not just few people like his disciples, Jesus loves masses. And masses are worthy of Jesus. Most of us think masses are worthy of Super Bowl. Masses are worthy of two guys running around in the ring and beating one another. Some of us think masses are worthy when there's, you know, 24 guys running around with an inflated piece of cloth and shooting up in the air. Masses gather for big meetings that have nothing really to do with very important things in life. But when it comes to masses gathering for the things of God, we feel like masses don't deserve Jesus and Jesus shouldn't get masses. But the Bible teaches us otherwise. Everywhere Jesus was, masses were there. Because Jesus' heart and Jesus' passion is not just for the few people. His passion and his desire is for the masses. His passion and his desire is for big, big crowds. So here is Jesus and he has masses around him because of his big compassion, big power. And here are disciples who say, Jesus, I know that masses are around you, but you got to send them off. You got to send them away from you because we don't have enough money to feed them. And we don't have enough power to attend to them. And therefore you got to send them off. And Jesus says, not so. I want to just start off to encourage us with one very important thought. That we have to have a vision where in our vision we see masses coming to Jesus Christ. Jesus has a vision and Jesus has a desire not just to feed your belly. He has a desire to feed a city. He has a desire to feed a crowd. He has a desire to heal not just few but he has a desire to heal many. He has a desire to heal masses. And many times we as Christians, because of our limitations, because of our insecurities, we settle for a mini vision when Jesus Christ has a masses in his mind. And we want Jesus to reduce his vision to our comfort zone, to our convenience, to just filling this place up, you know. I mean, even tonight if we're looking, you know, this place is almost filled. 
that is not the plan of Jesus the plan of Jesus is to fill the stadium the plan of Jesus is to fill the Toyota Center the plan of Jesus is to fill the track the plan of Jesus is not to just fill disciples belly the plan of Jesus is to fill the every belly that is around Jesus his eyes is on the masses he sees everyone we only see ourselves we only see our family Jesus sees everyone and he cares for everyone and loves everyone it's like that man who went fishing and another fisherman observed him and this man was fishing and anytime he would catch a big fish he would throw it away so the other guy observed that and he comes up to him and he says I've noticed all the big fish you throw away and all the small fish you keep what's up with that he says oh it's, it's a very small, simple solution he said the problem is that I have a very small frying pan and he says I cannot take all the big fish because I can't fry them he said dude why don't you get a big frying pan he said never thought about that and that's how many people are we keep all the small visions because our small mind is like this frying pan and so when Jesus is saying I want to touch a city you're like no 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 my frying pan says God can only touch my children when Jesus is saying I can use you to heal people you're like no my frying pan says only medical insurance can heal people you gotta enlarge your frying pan to the size and the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ can somebody say amen Jesus's heart and Jesus's passion is on multitudes because he's moved by compassion our focus many times is on mediocrity because we are moved by convenience we are moved by comfort we are moved by the things that make sure nothing costs us and Jesus has a vision his vision is for our city his vision is to change our city because of this vision we also have to embrace this vision you know I was in my parents house uh, yesterday and seeing you know there was a big miracle that happened in my family uh, when you know not only that God protected us you know I have two brothers and two sisters but um, that last year in the beginning of this year that God touched my brother and uh, it was a big very big painful experience last seven years when my family and all of us we actually had to pray for my brother and so, so much pain that when he was suffering it brought to all of us but especially to my parents seeing the joy on my parents faces and seeing the comfort even in my siblings now knowing that our brother is doing good actually better than most of us now because he's bossing the rest of my siblings and telling them when he's gonna have a home group and they all have to arrange after him because supposedly he's the boss in the house <laughs> He's like I'm the youngest one who have the home group but doesn't necessarily mean that you guys are gonna push my home group around I'm gonna have a home group and the rest of you find another place you know and it brings so much joy when I was in my parents house yesterday and it brings so much joy I was driving back home and I was like this is so amazing to see a family that now has joy where there was sorrow last week I had a chance to meet with my brother you know we went to, to Starbucks and we started to talk and and to talk to him I mean you're talking like to a pastor you're almost like talking to an apostle he already has visions he already thinks clearly the way he's talking about his relationship with God the way he's talking about his morning prayer he's like I just increased my tithe from 10 to 15 percent just I'm just feel like God wants me to pray not an hour but an hour and a half and I'm like wow you would have never thought you're talking to somebody who just not long ago literally was surviving and living in sin and living in struggles and tormented by the devil and by the demons how many people are like him today in my city that Jesus sees see we see them as drug addicts Jesus sees them as home group leaders he sees them as apostles he sees them as prophets he sees them as pastors he sees them as businessmen he sees masses so he tells disciples I know you want to kick them away from my heart but I see them and not only that the fact they're hungry I see what could become of them if they become filled don't push the crowd away from my heart Jesus's heart is not set on just rescuing few old elderly people in our city his heart is set on rescuing the people who are hungry because he sees beyond their hunger beyond them shooting themselves up with drugs beyond themselves sliding the wrist beyond themselves stealing from the store to pay for drugs he sees into who they could be if his grace touches them and if it wouldn't be for the grace of God I wouldn't be here
If it wouldn't be for the grace of God, I wouldn't be holding this microphone and Jesus saw me and because of that, he let his heart touch the masses. I was part of the masses. Today, let's connect with his vision. Today, let's not limit Jesus to this building. Let's not limit Jesus to a Toyota Center. Let's limit Jesus to his power and his compassion. Not our convenience, comfort or insecurity. Can somebody say amen? That's why our vision of our church is to see thousands saved, thousands healed, thousands delivered by the devil, thousands going from a dope dealer to a hope dealer, thousands going from zero to a hero, thousands going from a trial to a triumph, from a, te from a temptation to a testimony. Can somebody say amen? amen. That is the vision of Jesus Christ. Because disciples wanted to push away this big vision that Jesus had, push away multitudes. By pushing away multitudes from Jesus, they would remove the need to sacrifice to meet the challenges of those multitudes. By pushing away multitudes from Jesus, they are excused from trusting in Jesus's power and seeing his miracles when you push away multitudes you also push away miracles because nobody needs miracles to feed their belly we only need miracles to reach a city you don't need a deep great prayer life nobody who wakes up at 4 30 in the morning only those who want to reach multitudes who fasts, who prays, who gives, who sacrifices. Only those whose vision requires intervention from above. Who say, God, I can entertain few kids, but I cannot impact the city. That requires a supernatural intervention. The most beautiful part is when the multitudes were not pushed away. A lad, a teenager, was utilized to feed them. When our vision is big, our kids will be the tool in the hands of God to reach that vision. The teenagers will be in the hands of God to reach that vision. The children will be in the hands of God to reach that vision. And the little that they have, God is going to use to reach that vision. That's why we cannot allow ourselves today to lower our vision to the size of our provision. To the size of our resources to the size of our cultural background or our highest education to the size of our social circle no we have to lift it up to the size of what jesus sees and therefore we position ourselves for miracles and lads not to be used by the devil but be used by the holy ghost amen. can somebody say amen? amen we make room for miracles when we make room from masses when we aim God said go into all the world he didn't just say go only to people who speak your language when we make room for masses we actually making room for miracles when we say we don't want masses like disciples we won't sacrifice we won't pray and we won't see miracles. T.B. Joshua aims for masses. God gives miracles and we are going to follow his footsteps. We're going to aim for masses. Everyone say, people say, you're crazy. Of course, but that's where we have room for the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? Jesus has masses around him. If you want to know what's around Jesus's heart, masses people say oh religion supposed to be attended by a few people it's true nobody should attend religion at all but Jesus likes masses masses deserve Jesus masses are hungry for Jesus and masses will have Jesus because we will stand for that vision we will have that vision and with that vision we will need miracles with that vision we will need a prayer life with that vision there will be sacrifices and most importantly with that vision Jesus is behind us can somebody say amen? amen God created us to live with a vision and with a purpose your vision in life cannot be making money 
if vision in life is to make money you're the poorest person that's already alive your vision in life cannot be to get retired some people die at 40 we bury them at 70. you don't die when your heart stops beating you die when your vision caught up with your reality you stop breathing you stop exploring you stop pushing you stop trusting you literally stuck in the cycle even a statistic says if you sit for 11 hours a day your rate of death increases by 40 percent our bodies are designed that the moment we stop moving forward we die that's why Jesus the best thing Jesus can give for you is not just to heal your pinky it's to heal your eyes by giving you a vision and I'm not talking about a vision of building a bigger house and a nicer car or car all of these things are good but the vision of reaching masses for his name you may have few tacos and just a little bit of fish you may have just a small job and a small influence but I gotta tell you something you have someone who has access to miracles and he doesn't care how much you have what he cares is this how much are you willing to stand for believe for pray for and give yourself for and he will do the rest amen. he will do the rest can somebody say amen? amen people from the back to the front from the microphone to person behind the soundboard in our church has to have the vision you have to have the vision you may not have a car have a vision you may not have everything working out well in your relationships make sure you have a vision you may not have everything well with your health have a vision and have a vision that's connected with the vision of Jesus vision and the vision is not to fill your belly the vision is to feed the multitudes and then Jesus will always take care of your baskets he'll fill your baskets with more than you can know what to do with because that is our Jesus in Jesus name can somebody say amen we see the moment they have vision Jesus gives them this vision and disciples finally says Jesus well we cannot fulfill this vision and Jesus says to them what do you have and they quickly find out they have very little and they bring to Jesus five loaves and two fish I want to tell you something today when you give Jesus your best he will bless the rest I like to have quotes that rhyme it helps to remember when you give Jesus your best somebody say your best when you give Jesus your best he will bless the rest it's interesting that when they had a vision bigger than they were able to meet the second step that they had to go into is they have to give Jesus their best they gave Jesus all they had it wasn't enough to fulfill the vision but it was enough to fit in his hands we must understand one thing about the Lord many people don't give Jesus their best very soon they will be bringing to Jesus their mess and the reason that they have that mess is because they fail to give Jesus their best when as a teenager you give Jesus your best instead of giving your body to everything that moves in high school but you give Jesus your body you give Jesus your time and you give Jesus your best you will find out quickly you didn't miss on anything except unwanted pregnancies date rapes all kinds of money problems insecurities the only thing that will happen is the rest of your life will be blessed but if you say no Jesus I'm not gonna give you the best there's a little Johnny right here he deserves my best the Johnny will leave you hurt wounded and then you will come to Jesus with your mess but you will come to Jesus the question how do you want to come to Jesus with your best or with your mess some of us here today we already missed that opportunity to come with Jesus to our, with our best in certain areas we can still come to him with our mess but there is many of us here today you can still bring Jesus your five loaves of bread and two fish give Jesus your best he only then can bless the rest you can't come to Jesus and says Jesus bless my life while you're holding tacos in your pocket you can't come to Jesus and say Jesus bless my life while you're holding your life in your hands Jesus cannot bless what's not in his hands 
Jesus cannot bless and protect and prosper what has not been given to him whatever you and I hold on in our hands and we say God bless it and Jesus says I only bless what's in my hands whatever is in your hands is your responsibility whatever is in my hands it is going to be my blessing on it can somebody say amen say Lord bless me raise your hand say Lord bless me Lord bless me in Jesus name but you got to give him what's in your hands when it comes to giving to God there is main three things we have to give to God one is our life second one is our time and third one is our money our life when I say giving God your life I mean where you make God your priority in life your priority everyone gives God something but most of us give God leftovers a lot of people give God the secondary things if you want to be used by God to fulfill your vision to reach the masses to be a history maker you can't do that by putting God on the back seat or in the trunk God has to be a priority when a Sunday comes up you can't just simply you know a family picnic and this thing has come up um, well there's a hobby we're all getting together to watch a football game we're all getting together for this and that and there's Sunday every Sunday or every Wednesday night I just don't have time for church and in reality it's not the problem with the church it's not the problem with the time it's the anything that is a priority you always push and find time even when you were in school full-time and you were full-time work you still found things that were priority for you to do the issue is never time the issue is a priority when you make it a priority you will always find time and if you put God as a priority that means you're giving him your best don't rob God don't mock and don't laugh God don't give him crippled lame broken messed up twisted things that honestly you don't even give to your enemies God didn't give a beaten up Lucifer to die on the cross for you God didn't send demons to die on the cross for you he gave his best when you were at your worst why give God our worst when he is the best that doesn't work like that you gave Johnny your best and he dumped you you gave other people your best and they trampled laughed and you blackmail you and they still gossip about you God will never do that give him your best give him your best people before in other countries today even now they give God their best and not always they get a nice car promotion and blessing some of them suffer for the cause of Christ but they know it's worth it because God gave me his best I heard a story where three people were on the death row for the cause of Christ and these people dug out three 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 graves they brought the first person the other two were left somewhere far they brought the first person and they said if you deny Jesus we will let you live and go to your family if you don't deny Jesus we will kill you and bury you in this grave the person said mm -mm, I'm not denying Jesus kill me now don't waste your time they said okay since you're so convinced cover your grave with dirt and walk out so he walked out the second person comes in and they tell him if you deny Jesus we will let you live if you don't deny Jesus same thing will happen to you that happened to this friend we will kill you and bury you see fresh dirt we just shot him and killed him because he was just a smart pants like you you want to see your family deny Jesus he said well maybe my friend I'm gonna do exactly what my friend did I'm not gonna deny Jesus they said are you sure about that they said yes they let him live he covered his grave the third person comes in and they said you see your first friend was smarty pants didn't want to deny Jesus he died your second friend he died he says do you really think that this is worth it and he says are you sure two of them died they said yeah we killed them he said like they just died I said yeah he said let me think about it give me two minutes they give him two minutes after two minutes he's like well if I deny Jesus I could just go back and repent and Jesus will forgive me so he go ahead and denies Jesus and they shot him and put him in the grave that's really what happens in life anytime you're willing to give your life for God you will find it when you hold your life to preserve it you will always lose it Jesus said that give your life to God give your life to God stop 
playing church. Having a bumper sticker that you're a Catholic or a Christian does not make you a real Christian. That's like putting a BMW emblem on the Toyota. <laughs> if God is not a priority, you can't just call yourself that that's that you gave your life to him. Give him your best and he will bless you with the rest. Can somebody say amen? amen? There was this gentleman, he had a car accident. He was on a truck and through this car accident, he got so injured that he lost mobility of his body. He was placed on a wheelchair. He came to this church and in this church, pastor was preaching about giving and how we all should be very generous and give our funds to the kingdom of God. The church was moved greatly and after the service, all the kind of people who had some extra money, they gathered together and they gathered $12,000 to give this man so he can get a new car because he had no car. And this man on a wheelchair next morning went to roll up his wheelchair into his morning prayer and said, Lord God, you're so good to me, God. Even though I'm on a wheelchair, you already provided for my car. And as he is praying, God just puts it on his heart to give all the $12,000 away. And with a smile, no even hesitation, he said, Lord, to who? And God started putting on his heart names of people to give this $100 to give to this person $500. And so by the end of his prayer, he had a whole list of some 20 people he will give the money to. In the next two days, he did just that. Ended up on a wheelchair, still without a car. Two days after that, a gentleman calls him from the church and says, Hey, I've been praying and the Lord placed on my heart to meet with you. Is it okay if I come to your house? He said, For sure, come on over. He comes to his house and he says, God told me to pray for your healing. He said, Okay. He prays for his healing. The man gets up from the wheelchair, starts walking. He says, Let me take you outside. He says, God also told me after he heals you to give you a brand new truck and gives him a brand new truck. My friends, I want to tell you something today. When you give God your best, He will bless the rest. Can somebody say amen? amen? When you give God the best of your time, the best of your time is for some people in the morning. For some people, those that are night owls, it's for you in the evening. That's when you are fully awake, all of your cylinders are at work and you're fully just full of creativity. You have to give God the best of your time. When you give God the best of your time, the rest of your day goes more smoothly. The rest of your day goes a lot better. That's one of the reasons why here at 4.30 in the morning people come. It's not because people have nothing else to do with their time. It's not because somehow none of these people work. A lot of people between work and between school, they will come in and they will give their time to God. Some people would wake up in their apartment, in their room, and they will spend time in the Word of God. Some people before they go to sleep, they will give God their best time. Knowing God is not out to take their time. God is out to bless your time. But He can't bless anything He doesn't have in His hands. When you give God your best, only then He can bless the rest. If you want God to bless your day, if you want God to bless your work, give God your best. Don't give Him leftovers. Don't give Him things you don't need. Give Him things that matter to you. You will be surprised how He will reward you. Can someone say amen? Another thing that we give God the best in is in our finances. It's very important to understand when we make our money, when we have a paycheck and we give the best of it to God. And what is the best in finances? The best in finances is the first in finances. Why the first? Because the last is whatever is left over. But when you give the first of your finances, it is the best and it brought, brings the blessing of God on the rest of your finances. Can somebody say amen? You know, um, and when we bring our finances to God, we make it a tradition, we make it a habit. God begins to bless the rest of our finances for His glory. If you can kill the noise. I heard a story, uh, there was this man, Robert Morris, where he was preaching and he, his income was coming from going to churches and preaching. He would preach four times a month but this particular month he went only once so he really trusted God for God to supply by having this love offering from this service that he was preaching would be enough to cover his bill. 
and so he preached his heart out and at the end pastor comes to him and says thank you so much for preaching and I just wanted to give you this offering we want to bless you he opens the envelope and to his greatest shock he sees that four months four weeks that he would usually get were in that one envelope so he just overjoyed he said God thank you you're such a Jehovah Jireh you're my provider as he walks out from the sanctuary a gentleman who was in the service who is a missionary and shared about how he does mission work outside he they locked their eyes together and Robert when he looked at him he right away knew what he had to do he had to take he had to take his check God placed him on his heart and give it to that missionary now all the thoughts came into his mind first of all that is stupid secondly God just blessed you with it how are you going to pay for your bills your family will be in the streets God will never ask you to do that God just bless you this is not from God all of the thoughts like bees came into his mind says this is not from God but he says I knew the voice of God up to that point and I knew I had to act on it comes to the missionary and says hey I just wanted to bless you gives him the check and walks out he says when I walked out from there to the restaurant I died a million deaths and you would I would as well if you have a monthly income it's supposed to pay for your bills and somehow you just got this idea to give it to a missionary how are you gonna pay for your bills how are you gonna pay for your gas how are you gonna pay for insurance and all of these thoughts came in and he's like I think I'm losing my mind I don't think I'm hearing God he comes to the restaurant and this guy in this suit sits there and bluntly asks him a question says Robert how much was the offering pastor gave you in the back of his mind he's like none of your business <laughs> but he told him the number and this man in the suit tells him where is that envelope he said uh, my wife has it and that's when Robert lied his first time he said my wife has it he said oh really could you go and bring it so leans to his wife he says just says a few random things and looks back to him and he says oh she has it in her car so he lied second time and that's when that man looks at him and says Robert you don't have the envelope and embarrassingly he looks back at him and he says no I don't he said you gave it away Robert says how do you know he said the Holy Spirit told me about you and he told me that you will get the envelope the Holy Spirit told me exactly how much you will get in the envelope and the Holy Spirit told me exactly what you will do with that envelope he hands him a check and he looks at him and says this he said Robert today God taught you a lesson about giving your life to him he said you will go through many more lessons and you will teach the church how to live like that he opens the check and on that check was exactly 10 times more than what he gave away two hours ago. Wow. He said it touched him so much that the moment he got home, he gave away his bad car. <laughs> he gave another car away. He started giving, giving. And in, nine, in 18 months, he gave away nine vehicles. And in 18 months, he gave away his house, gave away all of his retirement, all of his funds, everything. And in 18 months, got double more. And he says, ever since the, the, this day, I think he gave away some 20 cars and three houses or something. And he says, the interesting part is this, the more I give away, he says, the more money finds back at me. And it's, I've learned this very important lesson. When you give God your best, he blesses the rest. And you can never outgive God. Can somebody say amen? When you want to have a vision that becomes a reality, you must understand you have to give God your best. Can somebody say amen? Will anybody give God their best in this place tonight? We see when the boy gives Jesus his best, Jesus touches it and after that he gives it back to the disciples and disciples, we don't see disciples eating, we, just, we see disciples passing on this thing that Jesus touched to other people. Now the interesting part, if you read the Bible or maybe you're hearing the story for the first time, that the bread did not multiply in the hands of Jesus and bread did not multiply in the hands of disciples bread only multiplied when it left the hands of disciples into other people 
whatever leaves your hands that's what truly can multiply in your life anything you hold on to that you're supposed to share with other people anytime you hold on yourself your smile your resources your house your car your things instead of you know opening your life to bring other people closer to God you close your life from that remember that thing can remain blessed but not multiplied whatever we give multiplies whatever we keep if we honor God with it, God will bless it. But multiplication belongs to those who choose to give. And it's interesting when they gave, all the masses were filled. People start eating. Everybody were, eat, were eating to the fullest and they were blessed. And something happens after that. We read that Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I want you guys to gather, go and gather all the leftover fragments. Bring them in. And as they gather them, they begin to fill the baskets. And the Bible says 12 baskets were filled with fragments. So here is a boy who had enough to fill his belly. But Jesus wanted to touch the multitudes with what he had. And not only touch the multitudes and not only feed this man's belly. But at the end wanted to leave him with 12 baskets of food. For the rest of his very long life he was probably a college student and those 12 baskets would last him 12 years 12 baskets that were there i want to tell us something tonight that when people get saved when people come to church many times they are like those fragments of bread that are left scattered in the field and we have to find them and put them in a basket basket is a home group imagine a field full of miracles all around disciples lost and these fragments today they are lost tomorrow they are wasted today they are lost tomorrow they are worthless and Jesus says gather these fragments put them into the baskets as you put them into the baskets not only you collect them and you find them but you also make them useful and tomorrow they will feed someone else many times people in the world are lost in sin but when they come to church many people get lost in church lost in church is when people come to church week after week they're not connected to no one they're not in anybody's home group nobody knows how they're doing and usually their life goes in the same way as it was before they start coming to church and it is sad to get lost at church people who come you know i have a home group and sometimes I would see people who come to our home group or I would meet people who come to our church and I would find out where they went before and they would say you know I went to a particular church you know a Catholic church or a Christian church I went and I would ask him so how did you go every Sunday really I asked him you know did you ever read the Bible never read the Bible hmm, okay I would ask him about basic stories of the Bible I would ask him how do they pray I don't know how to pray tithing what is tithing I don't know how to give you would find people living as boyfriend and girlfriend going to church for years completely fine you're like how could you go to church and not see your life changed did you ever end up in some kind of a home group home group no oh you were lost in church and they would come here get saved get baptized get married some of them for the first time in their life pick up a bible and actually begin to read it and have questions about it for the first time begin to bring people to church and see their lives saved not because our church is better it's because in the church somebody took them from the field and put them in a basket if somebody would have done that to them in the other church their life will also be changed 
I wonder how many people in our church are lost. And I'm not talking about lost in drugs. I'm talking about lost in the fact they're not in a basket. Lost in the fact that nobody knows how they're doing, what they're doing, what's going on. Nobody has them on their prayer list and they don't have a basket they go to. See today you may be lost but tomorrow you're wasting potential. Because if you would find a basket today, not only you will be accountable and grow, but tomorrow you'll have your own basket. Tomorrow you'll bring other people to Jesus Christ. Tomorrow your hands are not going to be taking things from the store, but laying hands upon the heads of other sick people. Because today if a loaf is in the basket, it's saved, but tomorrow it's going to feed somebody. And you will very quickly see people who are in the baskets in our church, quickly see their lives change. Yeah, there's sacrifices. Yeah, all of this stuff, but that's normal. You will see quickly, not only they stay in the basket, but tomorrow they begin to feed someone. And they begin to have their own basket, their own home group, and they begin to touch other people's lives. That is the purpose of God for you. I want to challenge you today. Get in a basket. Don't be in a field. Don't come just to church and warm the pew. Please, I ask you, get in the basket. There's 12 baskets Jesus had. We have 24. We want every basket to be filled and then we want people in those baskets to start their own baskets and make more baskets and we're just going to have a basket church. Can somebody say amen? amen. <laughs> Two weeks ago we made a change in our baskets. We made a change in our home groups where my home group, I closed my home group in a sense that instead of inviting more new people in our home group, the people that we already had who were coming consistently with some of them who already have home groups and with the rest of them, we put them under an assignment to start home groups with the next month or two. Some of them only had one week. And with this way, instead of people always coming to my home group, we shift now our church to not grow home groups, grow a home group, but to grow a home group leaders where we can have more baskets then maybe you don't like my basket you can go to someone else's that you can have a place where somebody knows your name or somebody can connect with you and where you are not lost in the church please understand all these beautiful stories you hear of people here people going to Mexico people who are being healed people who are stepping out from one place to another doing great things for God it's not because our church is better than the church you came from it's because those people left the field and have been brought into a basket. If you go to the best church in town, but you sit on a pew, you never get involved in a circle, you will also be a lost sheep. Not lost that you're not going to go to heaven. A lost is that you're not going to bring heaven on earth. You will just live for your belly instead of filling the basket. You will just live for your own life, just getting God blessed but not touching other people's lives and that is not your purpose in life. My challenge to you today, if you have not committed to a home group, go to a home group this week. Make a home group a priority. Maybe you've been coming to a home group in two weeks, two, three weeks. We are starting a training that will last three months on Friday to raise up other people who will start home groups. Home groups are easy to run. They're very simple. It's about loving people and loving God. And each one of us can do it. I want us to see 300 home groups in our church. I want us to see this place being packed completely with home group leaders. This is this, what we have today. We're going to have more and more. But the real plan is so that when you come to church, you're not lost. And the more people we have, the harder it is now for us to mentor people without home groups. I remember when um, Adriana, I met Adriana a uh, second time and I said, hey, good to see you. Welcome to our church. You know, is this your first time? She said, no, my third. And I felt so embarrassed. I was like, how in the world I wasn't able to see her? A few days ago, a man walks through the halls. I'm walking through the Head Start area, approaches me. Hey, Pastor Vlad. I was like, hi. I was like, I don't know who you are. We're walking in the halls and this is some, you know, stalker or somebody. And he says, I was here at the conference. He said, you infused me with so much passion. I was like, which conference? 
He said, the one few weeks ago. He says, it touched my life so much for the life of me. I don't recall seeing, ever seeing him close to our property. Same thing happened last week. I come up to these people and I say, hey, awesome to see. Is this your first time? It's been our third time. And I'm like, either my memory is losing. And I came to our leaders and I said, like, guys, I'm losing track. I'm trying to meet every single person. And I'm realizing we no longer have 40 people in our services. I no longer can meet every single person. Now I have to rely on the leaders. Now the baskets have to do their job. Now all of us have to rise up. If you wait for Pastor Vlad, Ilya or a pastor to go talk to every single person, my friends, those days are over. Now you who've been coming for more than twice, this is your church and you have to do the talking, you have to do the inviting and you have to help another person get into the basket. Can somebody say amen? I don't want one person in our church to be lost. Amen. We don't want people to be lost in the world and we don't want people to be lost in the church. Maybe it's hard for you to connect with one of the leaders. Find another basket. There's no offense. There's no problem. As long as you grow and as long as you feed other people and as long as you help other people for the glory of God. Because somebody say amen. In the conclusion, not only that disciples, you know, received this great miracle and they were generous with what they had, the little boy, but they also learned one very important lesson, is that just because God did a miracle and just because you are generous, you still have to pick up the fragments. Two years ago, there was a very awesome revolution that happened in my heart when it comes to giving. When it comes to giving sacrificially and giving more than I gave before. One thing that happened to me when I started to give more is I felt like because I give, I don't have to no longer have a budget. I no longer have to be responsible with my finances. Because now I give, God is just going to supply, I can do whatever I want to do. And very quickly I realized if I'm going to keep a really loose lifestyle and I'm not going to gather up the fragments, very soon I am going to have a full belly and empty baskets. A lot of people who are generous, who have empty bank accounts it's not because they give too much it's because they spend really bad and Jesus doesn't just want to teach us to give God our best he also wants to teach us how to manage the rest how to take care of the rest how when you see a sale it's the same thing as a demon mm -hmm. if you're a college student you're trying to get through sale for you it's a trap it's a temptation and the word budget is another word for God for you budgeting is your way to live just because you give 10% it doesn't give you a right to max your credit cards just because you give 10% it doesn't give you the right you have money laying all around in your field you have nothing in your bank account not because you give too much but because now you have to pick up fragments so that every single month you have extra in your bank account God wants you to be blessed God wants you to be generous and God wants you to have extra but that extra will not come if you are not going to do the picking up the fragments can somebody say amen when you give God your morning, you read a chapter or you pray for 30 minutes, that does not mean that the rest of your day has to go in watching soap operas. Or like the statistic says, and the average person in the United States spends 42 minutes every single day on Facebook. And when you begin to waste your life on other things, you find out at the end of the day, you didn't do anything, you're depleted, you're, you're tired, you're just so, didn't accomplish anything, you're like, man, but I prayed, you prayed, but you need to gather into your baskets. You also need to manage your time. Can somebody say amen? And same thing with our health and same thing with every area of our life. Let's have a vision, church. Let's also give God our best and let's get into the basket. Amen.